This is Nightly Business Report with Bill Griffith and Sue Herrera. Crude realities. Oil prices climb after two oil tankers were attacked in the Gulf of Oman, and the White House says Iran is to blame. Production shift. Some companies are moving operations out of China and into Vietnam to reduce the tariff impact. But is it a risky bet? Unconventional wisdom. When it comes to saving for retirement, is the traditional approach outdated? Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, June 13th. And we do bid you a good evening, everybody, and welcome. It's been a while since the energy market was rattled like this. Oil prices today climbed after two oil tankers were attacked in the Gulf of Oman, which is near the Strait of Hormuz, a crucial passageway for global crude shipments. The attack lifted the price of domestic crude by as much as 4% during the day. It settled up 2%. Now, this is a region where tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran have been running high lately anyway. And in fact, late today, the White House blamed Iran for this latest attack. Hadley Gamble reports tonight for us from the United Arab Emirates. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo blaming Tehran for the attacks on two tankers in the Gulf of Oman earlier today, but stopping short of calling for a military response. It is the assessment of the United States government that the Islamic Republic of Iran is responsible for the attacks that occurred in the Gulf of Oman today. This assessment is based on intelligence, the weapons used, the level of expertise needed to execute the operation, recent similar Iranian attacks on shipping, and the fact that no proxy group operating in the area has the resources and proficiency to act with such a high degree of sophistication. The U.S. Fifth Fleet responding to distress calls around 6 and 7 a.m. local time today as two tankers, the Front Altair and the Japanese tanker Kokoku Segyo, were engulfed in flames. The two attacks took place just 70 miles from where we're standing on the coast of Fujairah in the United Arab Emirates, right in the middle of one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. And coming just a month after a similar attack on four other tankers right off the coast of the UAE. And as Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was in Tehran looking to mediate. Just hours after the attack, the president tweeting, While I very much appreciate Prime Minister Abe going to Iran to meet with the Ayatollah, I personally feel that it's too soon to even think about a deal. They are not ready and neither are we. It's a big shift for the president, who over the last several months has said again and again that all he's waiting for is a call from Tehran. And while clearly these attacks are signaling a change of tone from the White House, there still hasn't been much of a response from countries here in the region, like Saudi Arabia and the UAE. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Hadley Gamble in Fujairah. So if these attacks continue to escalate, what will it mean for the price of oil and both the global and domestic economy? We're joined tonight by Kyle Cooper, an analyst at Ion Energy. Kyle, welcome. Nice to have you here. Hi, and thank you. Many of us were surprised that, that we didn't see a bigger reaction on the close in crude oil. Why do you think that is? Absolutely. I think that uh, the biggest overriding factor that is limiting these price increases is the recent trend in U.S. inventories. Uh, the, the preceding 12 weeks have seen U.S. total petroleum inventories rise 91 million barrels, and that's second only to a 92, a little over 92 million barrel increase registered all the way back in June of 2001. So with ample inventories, there's simply less fear that, uh, that, that a supply disruption would truly cause a physical disruption. Having said that, though, as we pointed out the, at the top, it's been a while since energy prices have responded to a geopolitical event like this. Is the market trying to tell us something this time around, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it still goes back to those inventories. Quite simply, the world is more comfortable since U.S. inventories are so robust. And also, they're worried about the continuing implications of trade tariffs and what and a, uh, an escalation here would do to the global economy and thus demand. So there's really been a huge demand focus. And uh, this actually, while certainly highlighting the supply risk, also points to that possibility of lower demand. And how much of a reaction would you see, do you think, on a global basis, um, given what the president said, that we're not ready to make a deal? Uh, these attacks, these are not the first attacks. And we don't have a trade deal yet with China. What are your longer term expectations? Right now, I'm still a little bit bearish in the near term, just because in general, if you look at the market over the last year or so, the market was very bullish up until the October uh, of 18 high of uh, almost $77. It collapsed into December of, 
uh, to 4236. Then it ran back up to 6660. Now we've had a, a bearish trend. And right now, as, as you mentioned, you know, th had this had this event happened two months ago, I think we'd have been up three to four dollars. And I, so I think it reflects the current sentiment that actually is still quite bearish across the market. What do you think OPEC does with all of this? I mean, they've been trying to keep prices going up anyway as they hold the line on production cuts. So but in light of what's going on between Saudi Arabia and Iran, what do you think OPEC does with it? Absolutely. At a bare minimum, they're going to try to keep the current production in place. And also to highlight kind of the bearish sentiment is there was a report that Algeria was floating the idea of possibly increasing the current production cut from 1.2 million barrels to 1.8 billion barrels. And the market just doesn't believe it. So at a minimum, they're going to try to keep this level. And I think Saudi Arabia would like to see even further production cuts. Does it have implications for monetary policy? Certainly does. I mean, while the Fed doesn't say they react, and, and you know, the, they a lot of times look at CPI excluding energy and food. Clearly, the sentiment it would be uh, detrimental if prices were to rise significantly as a result of a confrontation. But right now, obviously, that's not a problem. Uh, import prices today were lower, mm -hmm. and even actually a little weaker than expected. So right now, there's not a problem with the inflation, but certainly it could be. And certainly, if there was a, a true escalation, that significantly spiked oil prices. All right, Kyle Cooper with Ion Energy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. To the market now, the rise in oil prices did help lift energy shares, which in turn gave the overall stock market a boost. It was the first rise in three days for the major averages, as a matter of fact, with the Dow climbing 101 points to 26,106. The Nasdaq added 44. The S&P was up 11. The cost of imports fell in May for the first time this year. The import price index dropped 0.3 percent last month, reflecting a decline in the price of most foreign-made goods, including those coming from China that have been hit with tariffs. Experts say Chinese suppliers may have had to cut prices to retain their market share. But the decline may also be the result of a broader slowdown in the global economy. And as we've been reporting, the retail industry has a lot at stake when it comes to the trade war with China, simply because they source so much of their products and materials from that country. Many companies have continually said that they're watching the situation very closely. And now some details of a tariff strategy in retail are emerging. Seema Modi has our details. Home retailers are starting to outline just how they plan to get around higher tariffs. RH, parent of Restoration Hardware, said it's selectively raising prices to offset higher tariff-related costs, moving some production out of China while also setting up its own manufacturing facilities in the U.S. According to Wedbush Securities, approximately 25 percent of its merchandise value is sourced from China. RH joins a growing list of retailers that are proactively trying to decouple from China. William Sonoma recently telling CNBC's Jim Cramer that it's also looking to shift production to other countries in Asia. We have a very sophisticated vertically integrated supply chain. We have a lot of people all over Asia. And so we have great relationships with our vendors and we started seeing it happen and we started moving product. Moving what? To moving Vietnam? Moving to moving Vietnam, to, to Indonesia, moving it to America and then also renegotiating with our current Chinese manufacturers. Question is whether this strategy of sourcing goods from countries outside of China will pay off. Analysts say there are risks of shifting production, especially to developing countries in Asia where you might not get the same level of quality. There also is an additional risk that if we start moving production out of China and we roll back the tariffs from 25% to 10% or to 0%, You've spent all this time and effort moving production out of China, and you go back to China. You know there are big question marks as to whether or not it's worth the uh, the the effort uh, at this stage of the game. Some are still taking a wait and see approach. One of the benefits of shifting the supply chain is lower prices, but industry experts say the next six months will determine whether taking a proactive approach to get around tariffs was the right move. For nightly business report, Sima Modi. As we've been reporting, there is a big push in Washington and among many states to examine the power of big tech. Senator and Democratic presidential candidate Cory Booker told John Harwood that while he doesn't want to break up Facebook, he would like to see some type of crackdown. Now, Facebook is really problematic. They're doing things uh, that are uh, that all of us in America, we just saw a Mueller report that pointed to um, how uh, foreign adversaries were using platforms like Facebook. But you're not willing to say Facebook should be broken up? I'm willing to say that we need to look at tech companies in general, 
because we have a problem in this country with corporate concentrations of power that are undermining basic free market, basic democratic ideals. And so if I am the leader of this country, which I, I, I hope I am, I'm going to be coming after hard these large monopolistic companies. But the fact that Zuckerberg um, was a uh, supporter of your initiative in Newark uh, with a lot of money, that's not the reason why you will not specifically, like Elizabeth Warren, say, break up uh, that company? Oh, I, I'm, I, there needs to be a lot of companies in America that are broken up, but it needs to be done in a sober, systematic way. So what I do have a more of a problem with is the tech companies who are allowing China's values on privacy, on security, using those tech platforms to squelch the human rights of others, to surveil their citizens. These are things I have a problem with. And tech companies are willing to sacrifice values for profit. That's unacceptable to me. Time to take a look now at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. We begin with shares of Lennar. They were upgraded to outperform from neutral at Wedbush Securities. The analysts cited improving sales and lower interest rates right now. Price target, $62. That stock rose nearly 2% today to 53.08. Union Pacific was downgraded to equal weight from overweight at Barclays. The analysts cited a number of fundamental challenges facing the rail operator right now. Price target, $170. That stock fell more than 2% to 167.15. And Morgan Stanley has raised its price target on Disney to $160 a share. The analysts cited the company's new streaming service, which begins in November and expects total subscribers to reach $130 million by 2024. The firm has an overweight rating on the stock, and the shares rose 4% today to 141.74. Still ahead, what the dairy industry can do to improve its image with consumers. Chewy is expected to price its initial public offering tonight and then begin trading tomorrow. The online pet supply retailer is the latest in a string of companies to go public in what has been a very busy IPO market this year. And with some exceptions, the reception on Wall Street has been pretty positive. Here's Bob Pisani. The IPO market just keeps getting hotter, but how much juice is really left? That's the big question. Look at cybersecurity company CrowdStrike. It priced and opened above its expected range. Online pet food retailer Chewy upsized its IPO ahead of its Friday debut. You know, way back in February, a lot of people were fearful that an avalanche of IPOs would cause the market to crash. But the big tech IPOs, other unicorns, they've been all winners so far this year. With Beyond Me clearly leading the pack up more than 400%, Zoom Video, PagerDuty up more than 100% each. It's no wonder the Renaissance Capital IPO ETF, a basket of the 60 biggest recent IPOs, up 34% this year, double the S&P. Prices are holding up well. 65 IPOs at price this year, 40% at price at either the high end of the range or above. Beyond Meat, Zoom, CrowdStrike, PagerDuty, what do they have in common? Fast growth and a large market opportunity. Beyond Meat is disrupting the food industry. Zoom is profitable with huge potential to expand in video conferencing. CrowdStrike's endpoint security business rapidly growing. How about those lone unicorn disappointments? I know, Uber and Lyft, right? Uber's down 6%, Lyft's down 20%. That tells us investors are not impressed with ride hailing, specifically valuation issues and deep losses. But there's nothing like this up market to boost IPOs. S&P up 15% a year. That leaves a lot of these IPOs vulnerable should there be a downturn. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. Mixed results for Broadcom. That's where we begin tonight's market focus. After the bell, the chipmaker reported better than expected earnings, but it missed on revenue. The company warned of a broad-based slowdown in demand due to continued geopolitical uncertainties. Shares initially dropped in the after-hours trading, but closed the regular session up a fraction to 281.61. 
Activist investor Jana Partners disclosed a more than 9 percent stake in Callaway and says it plans to talk with the golf equipment and apparel maker about selling all or part of the company. This despite Jana acknowledging Callaway's innovation and durable market share. Callaway surged nearly 14.5 percent to 1819. And another activist investor, Vintage Capital, is offering to make a buyout bid for Red Robin. In a letter to Red Robin's board of directors, Vintage said that it is prepared to pay $40 a share in cash for the restaurant chain and called on the company to launch a strategic review. Red Robin shares soared 31.5 percent to 33.48. Target is trying to keep up with rivals like Amazon and Walmart by now offering same-day delivery to more customers. Target shoppers in 47 states will now be able to get items delivered the same day by paying a flat fee of $9.99 per order. The retailer is using Shipped. That's a delivery platform service that Target acquired back in 2017. Target shares were up a fraction today to 88.30. And the country's largest meat producer, Tyson Foods, is going to begin selling plant-based nuggets this summer. They will be sold under a new company brand that will sell plant-based and blended meat products. Tyson shares rose a fraction to 82.53. The dairy industry is facing a number of challenges, not the least of which is increased competition from non-dairy drinks like soy and almond milk. And now the industry faces a very different challenge. There is a growing backlash from a video that has gone viral, and we want to warn you, some of the images are very disturbing. Rahel Solomon has the story. The video is hard to watch. Young calves on a farm in Indiana reportedly being abused, kicked, and in extreme heat. Other images also show them being choked and dragged, but the undercover animal rights activists that filmed it at Fair Oaks Farm say abuse like this happens daily in dairy farms across the country. More than having arrests in this case is education, is showing the world not just what Fair Life has been doing to their animals in their dairies, but what the dairy industry is all about in general. The farm is the largest producer of dairy in Indiana, and the alleged practice has now ensnarled one of the largest beverage companies in the world. Why Coke? Because Coke distributes products from Fair Life, which receives dairy from Fair Oaks Farm. It's an issue that's important to millennials who tend to be more animal friendly and also a major source of spending. Another challenge? In the past decade, sales of milk alternatives like nut-based beverages have soared. If you look at the way that uh, the nut-based milk market developed, so almond milk when it took over from soy milk, uh, that's taken about 15% of the market over the last 10 years. Dollar sales for cow's milk was down 6% for the year ending June 2018. Fairlife has said it will no longer use milk from the farm in question and are taking steps to ensure humane treatment of animals at its other suppliers. Coke says any form of animal cruelty is unacceptable and that they're investigating. Although it's unclear if that will be enough for some protesters. We're asking Coca-Cola do the right thing and go to plant milk and dump dairy. The Indiana incident perhaps a black eye on an industry already under pressure. And according to local media, the employees involved in that video have all been charged with misdemeanors. Rahel Solomon, Nightly Business Report. The National Dairy Council has this to say. The U.S. dairy community has a long-standing and strong commitment to animal welfare and takes allegations of animal abuse very seriously. Like consumers, we are deeply disappointed and saddened by the actions shown in the video as animal abuse in any form is not tolerated on U.S. dairy farms. The recent videos released are in no way indicative of how our country's dairy farm families operate. As a community, we are deeply committed to the continuous improvement in all aspects of animal care. For the full statement, you can head to our website, nbr.com. Well, is a statement like that enough to help repair the dairy industry's image? And what else needs to be done in terms of damage control? Joining us tonight is Karen Tiber Leland. She's brand expert who runs her own company, the Sterling Marketing Group. Karen, thanks for joining us tonight. My pleasure. You know, the problem they have is that social media works so quickly. The, 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 the video goes viral before they have a chance to even respond to it. And most people will just see the video and not hear the response, right? Absolutely. And the truth is that we now live in a world where one of the trifecta of issues that people like the dairy industry have to deal with is this rapid social media where everything just goes instantly across. And I think it's one of the things the dairy industry hasn't really taken into account in terms of their branding. 
So what do they need to do? You say there are several things, three in particular, that, that they could do that might turn this around. Well, I think one of the things they need to do is they need to consider that we're living in a different world. You know, a recent study showed that 60 percent of consumers are more concerned about animal welfare now than in the last few years. So I think they need to keep up to date with what's actually happening with their consumer base. Another survey showed that nine out of 10 millennials will change to another brand product if they believe more in the cause that that particular product is supporting. So I feel like one of the things they have to do is they have to get up to speed with how their consumers are now considering their product and their company now. And I don't think the dairy industry is up to speed with that right now. That's one of the things that they need to do. And we've talked about the changing consumer taste going to non-dairy drinks as well. Not milk. How, how well do you think they've responded to that? I think they've responded to that really poorly. You know, last year, just in New York City alone, I remember there was, we were out of oat milk in all of the grocery stores, and there was this huge uprising because there was no oat milk. And I think the dairy industry has really failed to realize that a huge percentage of their market sees an alternative now, and they just haven't addressed that. You know, if you think about it, milk's very iconic, right, in America. You think about pie with a glass of milk. You think about a hot glass of milk when you go to bed at night. But the reality is, is that there's a whole whole bunch of alternatives that didn't exist five or ten years ago, and I don't think the dairy industry's paid attention to that. All right. Karen Tiber Leland with the Sterling Marketing Group, thanks again for joining us tonight. Appreciate My pleasure. It. And coming up, an unconventional approach to saving for retirement. Something unusual has been happening in this market lately, as the Wall Street Journal points out. So-called safety stocks are not only rising along with the rest of the market, but they are also outperforming it right now. Experts say that investors are attracted to the group's consistent dividend payments and lower volatility, and it just demonstrates how risk-averse investors have become. And risk aversion is what you may think of when it comes to retirement savings. Conventional wisdom says you should invest more conservatively as you get older by increasing your bond holdings. But there are some who say you should actually do the opposite. Joining us to talk about this is Wynn Smathers. He is the managing director and financial advisors at Shorebridge Wealth Management. Welcome. Nice to have you here. My pleasure. Thank are you, you one who recommends you do the opposite or are you more in the you need to remain kind of nimble and flexible camp? I'm in the flexible camp. I think uh, with today's interest rate environment at 40 year low yields, uh, the traditional thought process of how you asset allocate has to change. And uh, in retirement, it's very difficult today to have a significant allocation to bonds like the old days, perhaps. 40 years ago and be able to attain all of your objectives. Yeah, I mean, th that was at a time when interest rates obviously were much higher, but there were fewer products that you could g garner income from. There are so many exchange traded funds and mutual funds and other things that can provide you with some income in addition to growth, right? Well, that's true. I mean, certainly the, uh, the product menu has expanded greatly in the last uh, 20 years in, in particular, but in traditional asset allocation, uh, you want to have your safe assets being the fixed income part of the portfolio. How you do that uh, could be with ETFs, mutual funds, individual bonds. But um, the old days, again, when you used to have uh, 50, 60, 70 percent fixed income in a portfolio, you really can't achieve your goals anymore and do that with to derive the income you need as well as to fight inflation. So as a result, the equity component of a portfolio is, uh, is more significant today. And how do you handle that? Obviously, every individual investor is different. But if you do increase your equity position, um, do you end up trading a little bit more? In other words, when you have a significant gain in a position, do you exit that position and bank the cash? How would you, how would you deal with portfolio management? Well, traditionally, uh, we, we start with an asset allocation of a split between stocks and bonds, for example. 
Uh, the stock portfolio is the growth vehicle, how we're trying to really exceed the rate of inflation and grow the portfolio uh, principle. The bond portfolio, we try to buy uh, very secure, safe bonds. The bond portfolio plays a role in our case uh, of being an airbag so that when the stock market falls, which it inevitably will do, we have a reservoir of, of uh, safe money to rebalance our portfolios. Okay. Yeah, and the other the other way that we think about fixed income, and this really resonates with our clients, is that when we do our allocation, we consider maybe eight to ten years worth of their income needs in their bond right. portfolio. Right. On so that, that note, way, when the when that, that way, then the stock. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. When we have to run, thank you so much, yeah. Wins Absolutely. Mathers with Shorebridge Wealth Management. Thank you very much. Uh, time. Finally tonight, yes. the St. Louis Blues are Stanley Cup champions for the first time in their franchise's history. But the big winner may just be one of the team's fans. Back in January, that fan, while in Las Vegas, bet $400 that the Blues would win the Stanley Cup. Now, that $400 has turned into $100,000. At the time he placed the bet, the Blues were in last place, and the odds of them winning the Cup were listed at 250 to 1. Good for him. Talk about good luck. And before we go, here's a look at the day's final numbers from Wall Street. The Dow climbed 101 points. The Nasdaq added 44. S&P 500 was up 11. And that is Nightly Business Report tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow.